Okay. Uh, the car turns on to the 17-mile drive through Monterey. My, sitter, my sister and I are sitting in the back seat with my parents up front. It's our Christmas vacation and we're spending it on a long car trip along the California coast. We've been driving for several hours and it's quiet, but the silence never lasts for long. My mother hates silence. Look at those trees, she asks. Don't they have so much personality? Nobody answers because none of us are sure to whom the question was directed. Of course, we all know it was directed at whomever would respond. This latest observation of hers, like the previous question, what color do you feel, came, <laughs> came deep out of left field and will remain in left field, unplayed as the grass grows high around it. Okay, let's take turns saying our favorite part of Hearst Castle, Laura. I don't know, something. I don't know, the pool. And, and what? You asked our favorite thing and I said it. Okay, fine, I just wish I knew why. I'm the only one in this family who talks. It was a good question, but one we couldn't answer. Perhaps the rest of us had just gotten soft over the years. There's no pressure, no awkward silence when someone else is made much more uncomfortable by the lack of conversation than you. Unfortunately, music is no substitute, and the, and the radio remains off as we all stare out the windows at the cypress along the highway. At this point, my father stretches a bit and straightens his back, perhaps anticipating that he'll be called on next. Dick, my mother says, employing the common but unfortunate contraction for Richard. <laughs> my father glances at, back at us through the rearview mirror. Anyone want, know what they want for dinner? He says, and my sister and I in turn reply, relieved to be asked something that didn't ensnare us in follow-up questions. Most conversations with my father have usually been this way, efficient and warm without being threatening. Emotional curiosity has never been his strength. Our few obligatory father-son conversations had been like trying on a tight wool sweater, squirmed out of as quickly as possible. His one safe sex talks with, talk with me didn't last longer than the red light at sunset in Barrington. Uh, Scott, I, I don't know what you're doing these days, but I hope you're being safe. I am. Okay then. And the light turned green. Years later, my father would surprise me by casually claiming that he had stopped eating lobsters after he learned that they made for life. It was a surprise not only because I knew how richly he enjoyed the taste of lobster, because, but because it revealed a romantic impulse that I would not be able to understand for years. We all fool ourselves into thinking we figured out our parents. For the most part, my father's provided the perfect foil to my mother. He's the straight man in her 70s TV variety show. He's the captain to her Tennille. There is the saying that in every relationship, love is never equal. One person always loves more deeply than the other. My parents showed me that one person always talks more than the other. In the car, my father is quiet again, scanning, the signs for, scanning for signs indicating our hotel. It's getting late in the day. The sun is nearly touching the horizon, looking old and red, shining just bright enough that you can look right into it without crying. My mother makes up a song. There's a tree in the valley where no one dares to go. For when you're there, you lose your hair. And the da 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 da. She'd been working on it for the last 40 miles. <laughs> it was one of those outbursts, a mixture of excitement and frustration that had become a source of entertainment for all of us. During the trip, I had developed a game with my sister that I could play. Every time my mother stopped talking, we would count off the seconds on our fingers. Once she spoke again, we would go back to zero and start over at the next pause. We rarely needed both hands. It isn't long before my mother turns around and finally understands what's going on. She blushes and faces forward, seeming truly embarrassed. 
I realize that my teasing has gone too far. Fine, she says, I'm not gonna talk anymore. She sounds hurt. I stare guiltily at the back of her head. The silence drags on for nearly 15 seconds. <laughs> you kids don't appreciate me? Pause, 13 seconds. I don't know why I even bother. Pause, 11 seconds. I am never talking again. Pause, eight seconds. I'm back to counting on fingers. She glances over her shoulder when she hears us laughing and sees my hands back up in the air. You don't appreciate me, she says, turning forward, but I can hear the smile in her voice because I do appreciate her and she knows it. This is just my way of showing it. If not for my mother's insistence on conversation, if not for her guileless pestering, who knows where I would have ended up. If not for the years that she had sat by my bed asking me over and over, what's wrong, what's wrong, until I finally broke down sobbing, how long would the poison and anger of youth have built up within me? What kind of person would I be now? My mom talked not to hear herself, but to draw me out. And today, when I brazenly count the seconds on my fingers, I'm still grateful that I rarely get past 10, because I fear the day that I will. I want to beg her, Mom, please don't stop talking. Don't ever stop. I hate the silence, too. Thanks. You talk